When Scarlet and Violet dropped back in November of 2022, I wanted to do something incredibly unique with the game. I knew that literally hundreds of thousands of people across the world would be streaming the game on release. And so, I got together with my chat and some of my friends to create something that had never been done before. And we came up with the most ridiculous challenge. How could this possibly be the most ridiculous challenge? I mean, what could possibly set this run apart from the rest? May I introduce the rules. In a traditional Nuzlocke challenge, there are normally two rules. You may only catch the first Pokemon on each route, and any Pokemon that faints is considered dead and may no longer be used. But we kept going. No items. Set battle style mandatory. No Pokemon centers. We cannot change out our current Pokemon in our party. Once a Pokemon is given a held item, it may not remove said item. No super training, no breeding, no auto battling, no trading. These rules are set in stone and cannot be altered. Thus, we refer to these as rigid rules. Additionally, there are fluid rules, which at the beginning of the challenge were as follows. Pokemon cannot share types in the active party. No legendary raid or pseudo legendary Pokemon may be used. No TRs, TMs, move twitters, move deleters, or move relearns are allowed. No picnics. If a Pokemon learns a new move by level up, they must be taught it. No primarily purple Pokemon may be used. If the first encounter in an area is purple, it must be forfeited. Only Pokeballs and Premier Balls may be used to catch wild Pokemon. Every wild Pokemon encounter must be engaged, no running allowed, dupes clause is enabled, no terrestrialization, all enemy trainers must be battled on site unless comedically far away, every caught Pokemon allows the player to use 1,000 Poke Dollars to purchase things from shops, gift Pokemon are allowed, and if a shiny Pokemon is seen, the last Pokemon in my active party will die. Simple enough, right? Here's where things get interesting. After every gym, titan, or team star fight, three of my Pokemon are put into a pole, the winner of which will be made unusable for the rest of the run, essentially killed. In addition, a randomly selected member of my chat gets to add a new rule, amend one of these liquid rules, or erase a rule previously added by another member. And oh yeah, I'm going in, of course, completely blind, having never seen any of the game prior to attempting this. If you'd like to check out the rules for yourself and all of the sub clauses and details associated with them, link is in the description. Now that we've read off about six pages of rules, let's dive right in. The first challenge we face is getting my capture card to not drop frames. I'm down on the ground. You guys can't see me, but there's my hand. Hi, I'm waving at you. Looking at my setup, I should have a USB uh, 3 cable. We talk with our mom and meet director Clavel, who I'm not a huge fan of at first, but he'll grow on me as the challenge progresses. Walking up Poco Path, we meet Nimona and get the chance to choose our starter. And naturally, we choose Fue Coco. I'm absolutely picking Fue Coco. It's like not even a question, guys. I wanted this playthrough to be able to have as much chat interaction as possible. I do need to name every single Pokemon after a member in chat. Fue Coco also gives us a thousand Poke Dollars to be used at any place of our choosing. Is she going to pick Quaxley or is she going to pick Sprigatito? If she picks Sprigatito, she's a fraud. If she picks Quaxley, I no, respect no, her. No, no. <laughs> I don't respect you. As expected, because she picks the starter week to ours, we're able to take care of Nimona no problem. Because we are unable to use Pokemon Centers, according to Rule 6, if we're healed without our say, there is no infraction of the Pokemon Center rule. We can't control the fact that we got auto-healed, so therefore it won't count against us. Lechonk is the first Pokemon that is encountered in the Poco Path no matter what, and as such is always going to be our second encounter. We continue onward in Poco Path, making sure to pick up every item we see. As with limited money and no Pokemon Center use, every single healing item is going to be important to the success of the run. Further up the path, we hear Coridon roar from the beach, and after parachuting down with our phone, we give Coridon the sandwich our mom so lovingly made for us, and follow it through the inlet grotto, where we're able to get another encounter. The first of which we see is a Young Goose. We can't use Young Goose because it shares a type with Lechonk. Uh-oh. That's a lot of dogs. That is something that I have heard about Scarlet and Violet. I've heard that Scarlet and Violet really likes dog Pokemon. We get ambushed by a squad of Houndour and its pack leader Houndoom after a scripted loss are saved by Coridon, who I'm now noticing bears an insane resemblance to Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. He needs additional sandwiches. Is that, that might be true, but I'm not allowed to picnic. Oh, I got Swift. I can't use that either. Outside the lighthouse, we meet best boy Arvin, who falls pretty easily to a couple of embers from Arfway Coco. We learned round, Polecat learned leader. We're forced to learn every single move. We just gotta rely on the level up movesets. 
Moving further into South Province Area 1, we fight our first of many trainers and spot our next encounter, being a Psyduck. Initially, we played with the rule the first Pokemon seen in each area would be our encounter. Oh no. Oh, that didn't do any damage. Scratch is fine. I'm gonna tail whip. Bro, he read my switch. Are you kidding? Between not being able to run from the Psyduck, not being able to heal in battle, and not having an item equipped, Psyduck is able to kill our starter with two water guns. Now, guys, if I'm being honest, as I write this script, I realize that I actually ended up running from the Psyduck instead of killing it. And since Arlay Chunk would have definitely lost to Psyduck straight up, technically, this would have been the first attempt in the books. However, we pressed onward and eventually lost to Severino the Office Worker with a Jigglypuff and a Skiddo over near the Cloth Titan battle. Literally zero gym leaders, zero team star bosses, and zero titans were harmed in the making of this attempt. Once again, I pick Pue Coco, catch ourselves Lechonk, as well as a Diglett in the Inlet Grotto, and Hopip in South Province Area 1. This is a pretty solid start to a team, as none of these Pokemon share types and gives my team an extra needed member. We grind a little bit against some wild Pokemon since I did not want to be caught off guard as I had been with the Psyduck, but apparently that was not enough. The strongest in Area 1 of the South Province. That sounds very scary. Alejandro leads Rockruff, who we have very few options to deal with. He gets off a double team and after a miss sleep powder and absorb, we're forced to take large chunks of damage before Alejandro even sends in his second Pokemon. His Lechonk further damages our team, and Makuhita is able to come out and kill our Diglett before Hoppip is able to bail us out with sleep powder shenanigans. That was really, really rough. R.I.P. Diglett. Before battling Nimona, we take the time to get our team up to around level 13 by taking care of all the remaining trainers in South Province Area 1. Nimona isn't a problem, even with her terrestrialized Pikachu ripoff, and after defeating her, she gives me three revives, which, of course, we can't use. Thanks for the revives. I'll use it on my Diglett. We enter Mesa Goza, defeat Team Star for the first time without terrestrializing. Now we have to do 20 minutes of dialogue and cutscenes. Oh, and we have to listen to this the whole time. The school portion of Scarlet and Violet is insulting. It's literally 20 minutes straight of mashing the A button and introduces a hub and set of characters that will have no bearing on the challenge at all. Not to mention the music. Some of you may disagree with me on this, but the school theme is unbearable. Combined with the low frame rate of the background characters, the lack of voice acting, and the terrible game performance, this really highlights the absolute worst parts of Scarlet and Violet. Imagine being a big part of the Pokemon speedrunning community and feeling the need to play this game over and over and over again. I don't even have like a terrible time when I'm actually like playing it. It's just this stuff. You're like, it doesn't look good. It's not interesting. It's not impressive. Like it just needed voice acting, really. And it actually needed to skip cutscenes because this is this counts as a cutscene. Also, and probably the most offensive part of the whole game is that there exists an option to turn off cutscenes in the menu. But this might as well not exist at all, because it does not allow you to skip anything. I'm not sure what the hell Game Freak considers a cutscene, but certainly this is one, right? Or this? How about this? I can't just hold X or hit the plus button or something to get past all the dialogue? They tell you, like, you'll miss the story if you turn this on. You don't miss anything. <laughs> Finally, after about 10 minutes of A button mashing simulator, we're let loose on our treasure hunt and allowed to once again explore Paldea as we see fit. We gain control of Coridon and start the three different plots of Victory Road, Operation Starfall, and the Path of Legends, all of which we'll be doing to completion for the sake of the challenge. We go to the east of Mesa Goza to South Province Area 3 and catch ourselves a Nackley, which we happily add to the team. After some trainer battles and a bit of wild Pokemon grinding, we come across a ladder, which leads us to South Province Area 5. This is where we run into a dilemma. So far, we've been playing with the first Pokemon we see in a given area is going to be our encounter. But this rule was created with the assumption that there would be Pokemon in the grass for us to encounter, like in Sword and Shield. Because every wild Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet's an overworld encounter, it basically ends up being a toss-up, as oftentimes multiple Pokemon load onto the screen at the same time. Like, I just looked down, there were all of them. How, how am I supposed to decide who I saw first? Hello, sir. Would you like to be my encounter? <laughs> oh, the answer was a yes. We catch ourselves a Skiddo and are forced to box it since Hopip is a grass type and double back to the west to go to the first gym of the game in Cortando. Also, during this time, we catch a Flitchinder in South Province Area 4. 
but because it shares a type with our newly evolved Crocolore, we're unable to put it on the team. In South Province Area 2, we end up catching a Mareep, which miraculously gives us five different Pokemon in our party. We fight some trainers, grind more wild Pokemon, and notably fight a level 27 Vespaquen, who I'm very positive we're able to defeat with our Nackly. This gives us a huge chunk of experience and allows us to evolve our Hoppip and our Mareep. Now, here, we should have just gone in and taken on the first gym in Paldea. Instead, I foolishly decide to fight the Rock-type Diglett in the field right outside Cortanda. Unfortunately, I was leading with Flaffy, and because Diglett has Arena Trap, we are unable to switch out into a Pokemon more equipped to fight it. Thus, we suffer our second death of the attempt to a random wild Pokemon. I have trouble, okay? I saw a shiny thing and I wanted to fight it. I feel so bad about that, because we needed that Pokemon too. That's just my irresponsibility. We arrive in Cortando and participate in the Olive Roll Gym Challenge. <laughs> Wait, this is actually so much fun. <laughs> One of the big things I was attempting in the early portions of this challenge was trying to manipulate the game into letting me encounter a Pokemon in areas Pokemon were not meant to be encountered in. I spend a good amount of time on the border of Los Platos and Cortando, looking to use those areas as potential encounter locations, but after some trial and error, I decided that this would not be possible. Oh, that was so close! Okay, there's no way it's possible then. Because the, the Cortando title popped up as I threw the ball. First up is Katie, the Bug-type gym leader. Keep in mind, folks, that unlike other challenges we've done on the channel, we're not implementing level caps due to a number of other rules and mechanics, notably rules 7, 25, and 29 combined to make it so that we're always being given a pretty exceptional amount of experience. Additionally, because we're going in blind, don't know the enemy trainer teams, and aren't mapping out our route, this led to my decision to ultimately not include level caps in our rule set. Therefore, being slightly overleveled, Katie proves to be easy enough, and we walk away with our first gym badge. Now the fun starts. After every single gym, titan, and team star battle, I pick a member of my chat to implement a basic rule or amend a fluid rule. We get to have strategically placed picnic, one picnic in between gyms. The first rule my members decide to add is an amendment to rule 19, the picnic rule, allowing us to have one picnic per badge instead of not allowing us to have them at all. This, well, well-intentioned, doesn't affect the run. I'm putting up Cody, Dark, and Bunza. The real difficulty of the run sets in, as I leave it up to my chat to decide which of the three Pokemon I put up on the chopping block is going to get the axe. Cody, thank you for everything you've done for us. I'll see you on the other side in attempt three. And that's that. In addition to the deaths that can happen naturally, there are plenty of other ways my Pokemon can be killed in our rule set. My chat had trouble determining if Oinkalone was purple or not, which led to them deciding that it had to die over our skip loom. That ain't purple. It only looks purple because it's next to some pink stuff. We've seen purple. That's not purple. I knew people were going to be like, well, actually, that's, you know, sort of purple. I'm like, if it's debatable, it's not purple. Chat thinks everything's purple. Next, we head over to do the Cloth Titan and decide to use our new picnic rule just to see what it's all about. This is good for morale. This, this is really good for morale. Taking revenge on the Skiddo trainer who ended the first attempt, we head into the Titan Cloth battle unaware of how they would really work. Luckily, Nackley is able to knock out the first phase with a number of mud shots, and together with Arvin, we're able to get through the second phase with no trouble as well. Another badge, another rule. My chat decides to have mercy on me, and amends rule 28 to need a full team of six before the sacrifice of a team member after a badge comes into play. Truthfully, this was a really necessary change as I wasn't aware of how few areas there would be in Scarlet and Violet. Normally, in any given Nuzlocke, there's gonna be about 40 to 50 different areas you can catch a Pokemon in, some towns, some routes, caves, and other unique spots. But in Scarlet and Violet, there's only like 30, counting both Cabapoco and Area Zero. Given that our current rule set guarantees that 18 Pokemon will be killed over the course of an attempt, this gives us a little bit of breathing room as we progress through the game. This also makes it so that we don't need to axe a Pokemon after Cloth, as we only have three Pokemon eligible to be used in our party. We make our way over to Artizone and enter the East Province Area 1. East Province is totally different. And it was the Sauracoria. We already have another Fire Flying type. But you know what? 
here we are. Encountering an orc Oreo who keeps whittling my team down with air cutters, and with rule 24 allowing us to only use Pokeballs and Premier Balls, we found that catching it was troublesome. This thing seriously almost wiped us. I might need to kill this thing, dude. Don't air cutter me again. Oh, whoa, no. We, we No, we have to engage. We have to, we're forced to engage on our rule set. Come on. Come on, Oracorio. Don't do it to us. Yes! Oh, thank God. I did not want to sit through the school again. <laughs> we deposit Oracorio and equip our Knackley with the Quick Claw. And due to rule eight, this is a permanent fixture. If our Knackley dies, our Quick Claw goes with it. We head down past Artizone over by Mila's base and encounter Xavier, the student. Xavier? Bro, he looks like a 35 year old. I was not prepared for Xavier. But once again, Rule 29 forces us to engage with any trainer we encounter. His Curlia proves to be a big issue right off the bat, hitting Knackley and Skiploom for big damage and getting a couple of confusions, which causes us some strife. Noibat goes down with a combined effort from Skiploom and Knackley. But this Zangoose is another beast entirely. I set up an iron defense, but Zangoose was still doing far too much damage, and I'm forced to switch to our Crocolore. Crocolore gets some damage off as Zangoose sets up a Hone Claws, and of course you know the rest of the story. Oh, you're kidding. Bro! Yeah, our fire type starter, right before the grass gym, is no longer alive. Even though we have both an Oracorio and a Fletchender in the box, because our jump bluff is still alive and has a flying typing, we're unable to add them to the team. We catch Psyduck down by the shores of Lavincia City, and unable to really access any more of the map, we find ourselves in a catch-22. See, our team does terrible versus grass types, and knowing that Brassius' ace is a pseudo-wudo, we know that our skip loom won't just be able to carry us through. Keep in mind, at this point, I wasn't too sure of the game's progression beats, and I thought that the next boss after Brassius was Mila. Obviously, looking back, there's a Bombardier Titan and the Dark Star Leader, both of which could have been accomplished first, but I decide that since our matchup is so poor into Brassius, I'm just gonna grind to fight Mila. We explore a big chunk of Paldea here, fighting plenty of trainers and wild Pokemon to get our team up to a level that I feel comfortable taking on this Fire-type boss with. This came with its own challenges, notably dodging a million different Tauros. That Tauros is eyeing me something. I know, I know it is. I'm gonna wait for it to finish its animation. Bro, that's so crazy! They see me from so far away! I'm literally surrounded. Finally, we evolve our Skiploom into Jumpluff, and with the rest of my team at level 27, I feel confident enough to progress. After the Star Barrage section, which features required auto battles that terrified me way more than they probably should have, we get to Mila, whose team I felt fairly ready for. Her Torkoal has Drought as an ability, and with Psyduck's Cloud 9, its fire moves aren't nearly as powerful as they would have been otherwise. Doesn't matter. We remove the effects of weather. I don't know what this car is gonna have. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about the car. Sheeter Starmobile. I make the very honest mistake of thinking that I was playing Pokemon. And the first thing I do is try to soak the Reverb Room in order to allow it to be damaged heavier by Jump Bluff. Hoping we can live a hit. Blazing Torque? Oh my god, it burned me. That must be a fire attack. It failed! It's got speed boost? Psyduck is very low and burned by Blazing Torque. I switched to Knackle Stack and hit it with Assault Cure in order to damage it every turn. That didn't do anything. At least we damage it a little bit every turn. I'm sorry. It's not gonna get damaged every single turn. Bro, this thing literally cheats. It literally is cheating! As you can imagine, this battle didn't go our way. I can't damage it over time. I can't status it. It's not actually a Pokemon battle. Is that what you're getting at? Is that what is that what's happening here? Nope, we lost. All right, that was run two. I really, really didn't want to do the tutorial again. Attempt three. My chat convinces me to pick Quaxley instead of Fuecoco, and. Well, yeah, after a bit of thought, I decide that I don't want to do that. I just love this little head-empty fire crocodile guy too much. I'm never going with another starter. I'm not. I'm just not. A new day brings attempt four, and per my chat's request, the changed rules and added rules will stick around even between attempts. 
One change that we decided to implement to spice things up a bit was altering rule one, from being forced to catch the first and closest Pokemon in a route, to shutting our eyes and randomly running around until we get an encounter. Okay, well, let's try this way. No, there's no way. I feel like I need to go this way more. Oh! Duck! With Fue Coco in tow, our fourth Lechonk, and a Psyduck as our South Province Area 1 encounter, we once again do some grinding by clearing out some trainers and fighting some wild Pokemon. Nimona's battle later, we're back in Mesa Goza. For, without a doubt, the worst part of the run. I'm going I am going crazy, you guys are right. Initially, in my script, I didn't have a single mention of Penny, as she doesn't become relevant until really the very end of the game anyway, but I figured it's worth mentioning that this is where she's introduced. Knowing that the first gym's in Cortando, we head back west and pick up a hop up in South Province Area 2. These areas are pretty sizable, and this time we end up exploring a bit more and running into Angel the Courier with a Mastiff and a Mudbray. Apparently, this little dog has an insane attack stat, and after taking some hefty damage, we're forced to sacrifice our Lechonk in order to make it out of the battle with no additional losses. Before Cortando, we also venture toward West Province Area 1, where we catch a Skiddo. Once again, we play a little Rocket League and take on Katie again, experiencing just as many issues in Attempt 2, being none. <laughs> After this, my chat decides to amend Rule 18, allowing us to use a single TM between every boss. That's our one TM use between boss trainers. Crossing the river, we encounter a Starly, which we're unable to put into our party at the moment, and eventually double back to South Province Area 3, where we encounter a Makuhita, which can indeed be added to the party. Okay. All right, that's different. South Province Area 5 gives us a Litleo, which, as long as Crocolore is alive, we will never see used in our party. Titan Cloth once again proves to be no problem, as our Psyduck is able to water pulse it into oblivion, and we once again enter the cave with Arvin to feed our Coridon a sandwich? But did I not mention that before? Yeah, after every Titan battle, we feed our motorcycle dragon dog a very good sandwich, which gives it the ability to tra traverse in a new way. Once again, we get to implement a rule, and my chat opts to amend rule 16, allowing my team members to share types. This gives us the ability to add both Skiddo and Starly to our active party, putting our team at six members that are locked in. Now, I know what you're thinking, why does my chat keep making it easier on me? Well, that won't last forever. I think they were just taking pity on me, seeing as I was on attempt four and hadn't even made it past the second gym yet. But yes, now that we have six Pokemon in our party and that rule's been eliminated, one is gonna be killed at the end of this gym battle. Overall, I think this is a positive change for the run and its entertainment value. Art is on bound, our skip loom tries to learn Leech Seed. Rule number 20 states that we must teach our Pokemon the moves they learn by level up no matter what. And this is the first time that I really don't want my Pokemon to forget a move it currently knows. Sleep Powder is too good, we just taught it Aerial Ace, and Bullet Seed has been carrying us on the damage side, so we're forced to get rid of Synthesis. Anyways, we make it to Artisan and try to do some parkour on a playground, playing around with Coridon. Come on, Coridon, dude. Come on, dude, you got this. To the east of Artizone is East Province Area 1, where Oricorio almost ended our attempt to, and we're able to get a new encounter. The game chugs a little bit as I run around blindly, hoping for everything but a squawkabilly. Eventually, we run into a Venonat, where my chat has to break the bad news to me. Oh, can't use this guy, he's purple! This is a purple Pokemon! If the first encounter in any given route area town is purple, then that encounter is forfeited for the area entirely! Yeah, Venonat, being a primarily purple Pokemon, means that according to Rule 21, this encounter is null and void, and we don't get anything at all. Keep in mind the emphasis that I place on the word primarily. It's going to come into play again. We continue onward past Artizone, exploring a little bit more, and we run into a Litleo, who is only the worst intentions for my team. Oh my god! Thank you for not flinching me. I don't really have anything that kind of beats this thing. It's gonna do a lot. Oh! There goes our only water type and a really important member of our team up to that point. Psyduck evolves pretty late, but it was named after one of my mods, a fellow streamer and real life friend, Vanjie. Per his request, we're gonna honor him with a 21 gun salute. RIP to the best water duck a Scarlet and Violet player could ask for.
Psyduck's death must have really shook me, since upon exiting the area, I returned to Mesa Goza in order to use some of our earned cash on a charcoal for our starter, Crocolore. This time, with our Crocolore alive and a flying type move on Skiploom and Staravia, I feel confident to take on Brassius. But not before a quick game of Sunflora Hide and Seek. We use our single TM to teach Staravia Tailwind, since there's nothing better we have, and go inside to fight Brassius. Oh no, a Petalil. A couple easy KOs on Petalil and Smoliv, and in comes the big guns, Sudabuda. Our Staravia has Intimidate, meaning that with some smart pivoting between it and Makuhita, we get it down to minus two attack and are able to send in our charcoal holding Crocolore in order to finish it off and take down our third boss, continuing our post-badge tradition of tribal council and rule altering. With Litleo, Skiddo, and Staravia nominated to the chopping block, my chat settles to axe the little lion who killed our duck. R.I.P. El Huevo the Litleo. I never even used you in battle. Finally, our first rule added that isn't an amendment to a liquid rule, and let's make this a pay off debt run. No yellows allowed. That's right. My chat created rule 31, which stated that I was no longer able to use yellow Pokemon, meaning that Wida, our Makuhita, is forced back into the box until further notice. Now remember, Members do have the opportunity to amend or erase rules like that. It's possible Makuhita sees the light of day, eventually. For now, we just stuck in the box. With my squad of four remaining Pokemon, we once again are forced to fight Xavier the Student and his unbelievable Zangoose. Now, even knowing this trainer was coming and leveling up a Pokemon with some experience candies, this Zangoose takes no prisoners and kills my Skiddo on a switch-in as I try to intimidate Pivot some more. We send in Staravia to intimidate and... I'm just gonna go for wing attack here. <gasps> oh my God! Don't get crit, Louie. Wow. Yeah, so with a Pokemon axed from the gym challenge, two of my Pokemon killed by the Zangoose, and another one boxed for being yellow, we're down to two usable Pokemon. We traverse further down the hill into East Province Area 2, hoping to get another Water-type Pokemon to replace our fallen Psyduck. Crabrawler is purple. I would say primarily, yes. The thing is, is with the yellow Pokemon rule, there's a little bit of a difference because there's not any sub clauses. I'm gonna shut my eyes and run forward. Now, here's the thing. When you're shutting your eyes and there's no musical note or audio cue to let you know when you change areas, it's pretty easy to retread into an old area when you're wandering aimlessly. This leads us to catch a Rookity that's not able to be used, so we immediately release it. We once again shut our eyes and run down the hill to our destiny, and potentially the most controversial moment in the entire run. Uh, what do we think? Primarily purple or primarily blue? It's kind of half and half, dude. I'm gonna Google Moraney. Pokédex color says blue, as it does for Toxapex as well. The hair is the majority of the Pokémon. Chat, fine, fine. You know what? You know what? Start a poll. Moraney. Blue. Purple. Let's take a deep dive into Rule 21, the Purple Rule. Many of the rules that we have include a number of subclauses which designate how we should proceed in the event of a situation like this. No primarily purple Pokemon may be caught or used in any way. A. Purple is not defined by dex color, but by actual color. B. If the encountered Pokemon can be argued as any color besides purple, like pink or maroon, said Pokemon may be used. If the first encounter in any given area or route or town is purple, then that encounter is forfeited for the area entirely. D. If one of our current active party Pokemon evolves into a purple Pokemon, the player must release it upon evolution. Not only is Moraney's dex color blue, but if the encountered Pokemon can be argued as any other color besides purple, said Pokemon may be used. Being that we're arguing about its color, Rule 21 Clause B allows me to catch and use Moraney. This is going to be controversial, but 60% of y'all say blue. We got ourselves a third Pokemon. Some of you watching this video may disagree with this decision, but permission from my chat a winning poll, and some rule deciphering that proves I could make it through law school, Moraney is our East Province Area 2 encounter. 
I think it's all about the ratio of, of blue to purple. I could have had a Dunsparce by the beach. I would have loved the Dunsparce, dude. Well, uh, it would have been yellow, though. That's the thing. This gives us a bulky poison and water type who, no doubt, gives our little trio of Pokemon some much-needed synergy. We decide to head back west in order to take on the Bombardier Titan and the Dark Star leader, Giacomo. You may have noticed this already, but I had not gotten an Inlet Grotto encounter, choosing to delay it until I was able to come back at a later point. I thought that since I had access to more of the area, that I'd be able to find an encounter that was better than a Young Goose or a Diglett. Oh, it's Young Goose! Well, I didn't avoid the Young Goose. But this gives us an additional Pokemon that if Moraini is blue, this thing is yellow. So you're telling me I can have it one way or the other? I think you're right. I think I can't have it both ways. I think that Moraini is more purple than this thing is yellow, though. Is that controversial? Does the arguable rule apply to yellow too? The basic rule, which a chat member can add, only states no yellows allowed, no primarily yellow Pokemon may be used. Because no clauses or no clarifications are added to this rule, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna call Moraini blue and I'm gonna call this thing yellow and we're gonna move on. During our journey to the Bombardier Titan, we end up using RTM for this boss split on Moraini, teaching it Water Pulse, and evolve our Skiploom into a Jump Bluff. Bombardier Titan in the books with literally no problem, thanks to Arvin carrying us. Let's go, my blue Pokemon. So blue, look at that thing. Very blue. We move into the cave to get another Herba Mystica, where we learn just how good of a boy Arvin is. This is one of the only Pokemon characters in recent memory who's written rather well. We learn of his injured partner, Mabistiff, and how he just wants the Herba Mystica in order to be able to heal him from the injuries he suffered prior to the start of the game. Oh my gosh, they're okay. His eyes are okay. We're helping Arvin's dog feel better. I, I, that's something I could feel good about. Chowing on another sandwich, Coridon gains the ability to swim, and another rule is created by my chat. Would being under the effects of torments, can't use the same move twice in a row, be a rule or just a nuisance? That could be a rule. Rule 32, dubbed the torment rule, is exactly what it sounds like. My Pokemon are now constantly under effect of torment, meaning I'm unable to select the same move twice in a row. If I break it, the Pokemon forgets the move. Yeah, this rule is no joke. Adds another layer of complexity to the challenge and forces us to constantly pay attention. As if we blunder, we could be risking a really important move on our Pokemon. Heading down to the Segan squad's base, we wonder if these Team Star bases count as separate areas. Segan's squad's base? Does this Swablu count as Segan's squad's base? Is this a separate area? Unfortunately, it shows up as West Province Area 1. This leads me to believe that the Team Star bases are not counted as separate areas, which those of you watching, having Nuzlocke the game already, you know this to be false. Regardless, I'm looking for more encounters to take on Giacomo with, and travel to the newly traversable South Paldean Sea in order to catch a new Pokemon. We end up finding a Wingle and using a large amount of amassed experience candy to level it all the way to a Pelipper. Pelipper. In an attempt to shore up my team, I end up just locking another Pokemon in the yellow dungeon. Yeah, that's a yellow Pokemon. We try out the East Paldean Sea next, and after some meandering, we're finally chased down by a Veluza, who's definitely not primarily purple. As we whittle down Veluza to try and get it to an acceptable HP where we can catch it. <gasps> oh, there's the torment. Oh, I have to get rid of Water Pulse. It's unfortunate as we just taught it Water Pulse as our TM use, but the Torment rule does not care. We catch Veluza and end the stream by taking on Giacomo and his team, making sure to give the Rev of Room the respect it deserves, unlike in our first encounter with one of these absurd Team Star mobiles. Overall, I like Team Star as a subversion of what an evil team is supposed to be, and their actual battles are certainly challenging enough, but the whole Operation Starfall quest is full of absurdly cringy and almost illogical moments, it does give us one thing though, and that's Clive, baby. Yeah, look at his pompadour. I can't get enough of this guy. The chosen member in my chat decides that our yellow Pokemon must be freed, and rule 31 was henceforth dissolved, meaning we get to add Young Goose and Makuhita back to the party. Rule 31 lasted all of two bosses, but once again, it gives us six Pokemon at our disposal. 
We journey a bit further and enter Kaskarafa, where the fourth gym is technically located. We briefly explore the city and try and get another encounter, but- Wait a minute. Are these background Aracuda or can I actually get this Aracuda? I don't understand the logic behind not being able to catch the Pokemon in towns. Why do they have to be background Pokemon? Just let me run into them and catch them, please. We get another Water Pulse TM that was situated over the dam, and we now have the ability to reteach our Marini a water type move. Making our way to the Asado Desert, we prepare for another encounter. Let's do it. Let's not run into anything dumb. Nothing purple. Nothing shiny. We narrowly avoid a number of Cacnea, and after a minute of running, I encounter a Capsicid. Now, I really love this little guy, and even though I'm not a fan of his Evo, and have no use for a Grass or a Fire type with both Jumpluff and Crocolore on the squad, I'll happily take another Pokemon. I'm really glad it wasn't a Cacnea. I'm glad we got something new. We box our newly acquired Capsicid and double back toward Lavincia, fighting trainers while taking the effort to train up our Veluza and Makuhita, who have fallen behind in the grand scheme of things. Oh yeah, and Young Goose. Definitely training up Young Goose with the intention of using it. Yep. We pick up the TM for Toxic Spikes, and Jump Luff tries to learn Acrobatics. Due to Rule 8 and having previously put the loaded dice on Jump Luff to increase the amount of times it would hit Bullet Seed on average, Acrobatics is suboptimal in almost every way. After some more trainer fights, Makuhita finally evolves into Hariyama, and this makes for another massive addition to our squad, as Hariyama is much bulkier than everything else we have access to currently. We enter Lavincia and take a moment to admire these billboards. Wait, that's so good. No way, a Crocolore with the cereal? We use our one TM of the split on our newly evolved Hariyama and give it Stomping Tantrum in the hopes that it will help us deal with Iono better. Of course, meeting us in Lavincia City is Nimona, who's really creepy, but very easy to beat. And we move on to the city's gym challenge. I'm being broadcast live to the world right now. Smile collab with me unless you know I can bring in those sweet sweet viewer numbers is she saying that I need to be a certain size to collab when do I get big enough to be able to collab with bigger streamers guys when Peach Chow reviews my Nuzlocke Peach Chow will never review my Nuzlocke because they're all flawless this is the first battle where I'm actually a bit nervous for the run, as both her Belly Bolt and Miss Magius are issues for our team, despite being slightly overleveled. Set mode, combined with the Torment rule, and not having any resistances to Electric means that we're forced to rely pretty heavily on Jump Luff abusing Sleep Powder. Her Miss Magius is a notorious Miss Magi- it's probably Miss Magius, right? Miss Mag- I say Miss Magius, guys, in the comment section, let me know. T tell me know how you pronounce it, please. Anyway, whatever it's called is a notorious run killer and an encounter check for this point in the game. And with access to Confuse Ray, Charge Beam, and Hex, makes for quite a difficult Pokemon to deal with if you're not prepared. At this point, our young goose evolves into a less yellow, more yellow? Gumshoes. The yellow rule was keeping our party safe from the chopping block, but being that we have completed another boss with a full party of six, I nominate Gumshoes, Marini, and Hariyama, heavily banking on the fact that my chat will get rid of our low-leveled Gumshoes instead of our defensive water type and physical powerhouse, and yeah, thank god I was right, that could have ended terribly. Additionally, my chat develops Rule 33, the Advice Rule. When the player's Pokémon is learning a move, a new move, the player must ask the Pokémon for advice, and whatever the Pokémon Wants is what shall be. In Scarlet and Violet, the game gets rid of set mode, fishing, being able to turn off battle animations, the interior of buildings, sparkling overworld shinies, Arceus legend catching, fossils, numerous character customization options, a decent controlled camera, Pokerus. Wow, jeez, they got rid of a lot of stuff, huh? But for whatever reason, upon trying to learn a move, they added the option to ask your Pokemon for advice on which move to get rid of. Pelipper added to the team, we start making our way over to the base when... I've been spamming Aqua Cutter. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to do that. I need to get rid of it. The torment rule strikes again as I went on autopilot fighting these trainers. Getting rid of Aqua Cutter actually hurts. Aqua Cutter gone right before the fire type boss. What could go wrong, right? We meet with my dude Clive once again and get into the Sheeter base, the place where Run 2 went to die. Veluza is able to whittle down Torkoal enough that the sun goes away prior to the Rive of Room hitting the field. This time, we have a much better matchup going into Mila, with three water types to our name and a number of better answers to this thing's fire stab moves, considering, you know, our starter's still alive. Another super cringy Team Star cutscene later. 
And might I remind you that skip cutscenes is on. Penny comes through with some more materials and meets our weird dog dragon motorcycle. And once again, it's time for our post-boss tradition. Rule 34, the PP rule. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's literally what we called it, is introduced here. And this one is another that causes me to have to pay close attention during battles and grinding. This rule states that if my Pokemon's moves fall into the orange threshold, then said move must be deleted. I put all three of my water types on the chopping block here, and expectedly, the newest member of our team, Pelipper, is the one who gets axed. We're then forced to add Capsicid to the party, and return to its homeland of the Asado Desert to do some more exploring and make our way to complete the Kofu Wallet quest in order to unlock the fourth gym. Really bad wants to learn Bullet Seed. Should a move be forgotten and replaced with Bullet Seed? I don't know. Really bad, what do you think we should do? Wants to forget growth and learn Bullet Seed. Do that! After a battle with Balin the student and our Crocolore giving us some really good advice, wants to forget Ember. So far, so good. I take a moment to stop and look at my chat, when suddenly... Okay! Oh! It's just a wild Pokemon. Good start, Swythe. Uproar? Oh no. Thankfully, despite having used Uproar, we're able to get it to hit itself in its confusion, causing it to end Uproar and allowing us to put it to sleep for Jumpluff to be able to finish it off with a Bullet Seed Acrobatics combo. Granted, I thought Espathra was a Psychic Flying type, and being a number of levels underneath it and not knowing its level up moveset, I was prepared for the worst. Guys, I did not think that that thing was going to chase me down. The speed at which it came at me was unreal. Scared out of our mind, we double back to East Province Area 3 to get another new encounter, hoping that it'll be something that allows us to deal with the water type specialist a little bit better. Woo! All right, Capsa Kid. You want to forget Sunny Day. That's the first one that I'm not necessarily a fan of. Holy sh- Yeah, apparently, next on the docket was the Titan Orthworm, so we used some of our Gathered Rare Candies to level up Capsicid, and then evolve it into a Scovillain, hoping that it will come in handy for the Titan. Wants to forget Bite, <laughs> and learn Spicy Extract, sure. Oh, and you want to learn Flamethrower, and you want to get rid of Spicy Extract for Flamethrower. Sure. All this talk of forgetting moves, and we end up teaching our Veluza the Ice Fang TM as an extra coverage move. Veluza makes the decision to get rid of Filet Away. Honestly, in challenges like this, setup moves that cut my health aren't my favorite anyway, so this is a fine change. Time for Orthworm. I chunk it with Hariyama and swap into our newly evolved Scovillain to end the first phase with a flamethrower. Second phase time, and with our good pal Arvin, we lead Scovillain, and all we have to do is flamethrower twice, and the Titan goes down no problem. Two flamethrowers in a row. This one hurts. It's always the strongest moves that we end up blundering on, huh? One more sandwich later, and another good boy moment with Arvin, Koridon gets the ability to jump even higher. No status inflicting moves. We only have Sleep Powder and T-Spikes, technically. No toxic, but toxic spikes is acceptable since it's not direct. Okay. My chat adds rule 35, the status rule. This eliminates our ability to use direct status inducing moves. However, from the rule maker themselves, we get clarification on the implications of this. Moves that can cause a secondary status effect are still allowed, like nuzzle, flamethrower, and ice beam. Honestly, I think this was just a play to prevent me from abusing sleep powder to get out of scary situations I'd been in, and was welcomed as some added difficulty. Because sleep powder is now unusable, I opt to put Moraney, our flamethrower list Scovillain, and our newly nerfed Jumpluff up on the chopping block. Immediately, my chat pounces on the opportunity and decides that without sleep powder and before the water gym, our Jumpluff should get the boot. Truly, I thought my chat would vote out Scovillain, but we say goodbye to our Jumpluff and continue on. We have three fire types going into the potentially water type gym leader. We make our way to Zapapico, where the only thing of note is this rocky helmet we find laying on the ground. Rocky helm? Ooh, that's an item. Who would I even give that? Yeah, we're sticking a rocky helmet on our Moraney. OU Pex is incoming. 
We enter the tag tree thicket and are teleported super deep into the forest by Clive to the poison type team. Wait, how freaking far in did it let us travel? Bro, wait, what? Where are we? Oh, that was quick. It was Impidimp. Okay. The dark fairy type? That's not bad. This is a pink Pokemon. For the record, this is not purple. Impidimp is a really great encounter here, as we have yet to have a dark type or a fairy type, and this type combo really helps out with a number of boss trainers later in the game. Finally, our Crocolore ascends to its final form. I literally love this thing. People are- I don't know how anybody clowns on this Pokemon. This Pokemon is awesome. Yeah, Skeledurge is without a doubt a phenomenal Pokemon to have in a run like this. And with access to Torch Song, it's able to set up passively as we click massively damaging Fire-type attacks. Unfortunately, Skeledurge advises me to get rid of Roar, getting rid of our only way of fleeing from wild encounters. Not that we've ever really used it before, though. Moraney, what are we doing? Wants to forget Venoshock? Oh, Moraney! Oh, you're so off the mark on this one, Moraney. We try to teach Veluza the Drill Run TM as we head into the Poison Type Star Leader. They wouldn't mind skipping over Drill Run for now. You're the boss. Instead, we level up our Growlithe a bit more with some candy, give it a Firestone to evolve it, and use the Dig TM in hopes it will help us a bit with Atticus, the next boss oh, milestone. One. Nice backflip, bro. Your hair game's awful. Actually, I don't think that's his hair. I think that's literally a cloth. Never mind. I take it back. My apologies. Atticus's Skun Tank actually puts a little bit of work on us, getting some really good damage on Moraney and poisoning our Hariyama. In comes Revivroom, who unfortunately bulldozes Skeledurge twice before I'm able to get rid of it with a Torch Song. Muck comes out, and I feel it necessary to recover back some health with Moraney. Moraney basically walls Muck pretty handily, and we're able to get up to about two-thirds HP before we're forced to take on the Navi Starmobile. Unfortunately, while Moraney walls this thing as well, rules 32 and 34 prevent us from utilizing Recover as effectively. I decide to pounce it to lower its speed and waste a turn before using our last Recover. It lands a lucky crit as we hit it with a liquidation, and since two layers of Toxic Spikes are now up on our side of the field, I'm forced to switch out so I can eventually switch back in and get rid of them. But then... Another crit? Stop! Yeah. It gets a second crit in a row, making Moraney useless for the rest of the battle and opening up my team to the wrath of these Toxic Spikes. I send an Arcanine, knowing we're in a pretty bad spot, and that we're gonna need to pull out some stops to get out of the battle without losing important team members. I hope that we do some decent damage with Dig, but we do about an eighth of its overall health? R.I.P. Arcanine. I wish I leveled it up a little bit further, but with three fire types on the team already, and without access to Intimidate, it was probably the least important member. In hindsight, I now know how these Reb of Rooms actually work. The stats shown above are the exact stats, not the base stats. They do not have Reb of Rooms base stats. The values are custom set rather than derived from base stats, level, nature, IVs, or EVs. During the course of the challenge, obviously, I had assumed that they just had Reb of Rooms actual stats. But instead, they're something entirely different. I know that now. Don't worry, comment section, I hear you typing away, but I did not know. So, this battle did not go the way that I intended, and we're in very real danger of losing the attempt. I swap in Veluza to hopefully do a little bit of damage with Water Pulse. Bro, this does no damage. That's so crazy. My only way out is to get some chip damage with Veluza's Aqua Jet and sending in Skeledurge to eat another Noxious Torque and finish it off with a Torch Song. It's done. Louis had it in the bag, we just needed to trust them. We do not lose a Pokemon because we only have five Pokemon alive at this point. That was, whew, that was rough. Two deaths to Atticus, and then we have to see Penny. Ugh, this day could not go worse. With only five Pokemon in my name, we stave off rule 28 for now, and my chat comes up with rule 36, the candy rule. This simply bans us from using EXP candies besides rare candy meaning that we're forced to use more of our healing items and encounter more wild Pokemon to grind manually. We spend the next several minutes grinding our team in the water by the tag tree thicket and evolve our newly caught Impidimp into Morgrun. That is not purple for the record, folks. We fast travel and cross the Asado Desert into West Province Area 2, where we're eligible to get another encounter. After running around blind for minutes on end and repeatedly encountering Oink Colognes, we eventually run into a Mastiff. It's a good boy! 
Finally, we make it to Porto Mirinda, give Kofu his lost wallet, and participate in probably the worst gym challenge yet? I miss the olive rolling minigame, man. The only other thing of note in Porto Mirinda is the assault vest we find lying on the and ground. And we just got an AV? I mean, Weta kinda exists here. Locked in. That Pokemon is holding that item forever. Is this a separate area? This feels very much separate area-ish. If this was a better game, this would be a separate area. Louis at level 38 and wants to learn Shadow Ball. All right, Lou, don't disappoint me. Forget Incinerate and learn Shadow Ball. Yo, let's go. Through this not so unique area, we enter West Province Area 3, where we run into a Fletchinder as our Pokemon here. I like Talonflame, but this is definitely a disappointment as there are Sudowoodo, Girafferig, and Primeape on this route. But what the heck, we'll take another early route bird. Nothing bad has ever happened to those. Back again through the Asado Desert, we train a little bit more in order to evolve our newly caught Mastiff into Mabasif and use our 1TM on Scovillain, who opts to forget Worry Seed in order to learn Grass Knot. Side note, Kofu's probably the ugliest character in the entire franchise. We dispatch his Veluza with our Morgrem, and he sends in his Wugtrio, who I worry has Arena Trap like its Cantonian counterpart. Don't tell me it has Arena Trap. No Arena Trap. All right, bet. Bet, bet, bet. This is really where we see Rocky Helmet Moraney come in clutch, as before we're even able to use a move on this Wugtrio, it's already damaged itself for like 95% of its HP. Y'all like to see Rocky Helm Moraney put in work here? It could have been worse, it could have been a Toxpex. Kofu's ace, unbeknownst to me, was a Crabominable, who obviously hits my team super hard with its Crab Hammers. Luckily, since we got a layer of Toxic Spikes up previously, Moraney walls it and crits every single turn because of Merciless. Chilling water. Based. We'll see who we give that to. I don't know, guys. I don't know. I put Morgrem, Scovillain, and Mabistiff on the chopping block, once again assuming my chat would not only protect the doggo, but kill my clear least favorite Pokemon on the team, being Scovillain. It's looking like Joe Mama's gonna be the one, dude. Y'all are really gonna kill the doggo? Y'all are gonna keep really bad? That was not enough to convince my chat, and they pull an old yeller. They then decide rule 33, the advice rule, is no more, and once again we have autonomy over deciding which moves we keep and which moves we get rid of. Any idea what I'm going to do next? I'm going to figure it out right now. Technically the next thing in order is the Medali Gym. Can I just fall down that hole? Should I fall down that hole? Do I want to fight that Garchomp? Wait, that's how you get to the Garchomp? Thank you for alerting me. That would have been a clip, probably. But now it won't be. Ha <laughs> ha ha. And instead, I'm gonna go down this hole. Oh, oh, sh Guys. Oh, oh no. He saw his friend run off a cliff. And then he went, he went, oh, the humanity. <laughs> After witnessing this, my Moraney finally decides to evolve. This Pokemon just got way more blue. Now, naturally, with the evolution, we open up old wounds and reopen the great purple debate. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, if the Mon's heart is purple. If the Mon's lungs are purple, we can't use it. We now decide it's time for us to get our West Paldean Sea encounter. As we shut our eyes to swim around, we certainly underestimate how long this could potentially take us. For whatever reason, maybe the spawn rates of Pokemon are really low in the West Paldean Sea. We find ourselves blindly doing laps, hoping we run into something good. There's no sounds. There's no boink. Like letting me know I'm even close to something. Oh? You're a dupe! First thing we run into is, of course, a Pelipper, who we're forced to engage. I try and run into one of the Kilowattril who spawned in next to Pelipper, hoping they'll chase me down once they see me, but with no luck. Eventually, I accidentally tread back into West Province Area 2 and immediately encounter an Aracuda. A real one this time. Not like the fake ones in Cascarafa. Are we in another area? Re okay, regardless, I catch it and I check it. West Province Area 2. Okay. Sorry, Aracuda. We re-enter the West Paldean Sea, already having two ineligible encounters within 10 whole minutes. As we're trying to parkour up to get a better vantage point, we experience an incident not unlike the Espathro in the Asado Desert and are run down by a level 41 Veluza. That scared the f*** out of me. <laughs> this is dupes, for the record. But we need to fight this one. Oh my god! Chill. It's level 41! 
taking a look at my team, it becomes clear that a combination of Aqua Cutter and Psycho Cut absolutely tear me apart. I send in Toxapex, hoping it'll decide to Aqua Cutter again, which it does. That's not a contact move, that's ridiculous. You're not dead! If that Psycho Cut crit, Toxapex would have been dead for sure. Sending in more Grim on a random fillet away, we're able to get out of the battle by sucker punching it to finish it off. Oh my god! And our reward, as it turns out, is that a gimme ghoul? Well, you know, if I shut my eyes, start mashing A, if I walk very slowly. With the camera automatically adjusting and the limited space to work with, Every time we fell off the rock, we were forced to make our way back on. Eventually, using our acute sense of hearing and the button mashing skills we learned during the tutorial part of the game, we finally, after over 20 minutes in the West Paldean Sea, get an encounter. Yes! <laughs> totally random. It's a pain to evolve and only knows two moves. Nobody told me that part. Keep in mind that I'm going into this challenge blind and without any real prior knowledge on this thing, I didn't know what I'd be getting myself into. 999 coins required to evolve it. NBD. We earned this thing, all right? You can't tell me we did not earn this thing. I was not looking for it. I caught up on the rock and I went for it, dude. There we go, give me ghoul, baby. I'm naming it Kelp because this is very clearly a Pokemon that you find at sea. Kelp is also the name of the artist who did the thumbnail for this video. Go figure. We then spend the rest of the night retreading parts of Paldea we already traversed to see if we can scrounge up some more Gimme Ghoul coins. Where to next? And an additional one, thank you. The great Gimme Ghoul coin hunt begins 20 minutes ago. Yo, give me six of them. Okay, one I'll take. Lucky 777, baby, come on. 60, okay, sure. Drain punch, no sh That's going to Hariyama immediately. All right, what's the ending total on the stream? 517. Okay, so we're over halfway there now. The next stream, hey, give me ghoul. Give me 10 of you. Four? Okay, we'll take four. I literally have to Baneful Bunker. We can't use the same move twice in a row or else Torment rules come into effect. For the record. Do it again. Oh, 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 I didn't. Even when I'm conscious of the Torment rule being in effect, it's just so easy to mash A through battles and accidentally use the same move again. Over in Maidali, I spend a number of minutes getting lost around the very similar looking buildings trying to find the guy who gives out more Gimme Ghoul coins. Ho! Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we got it! You look like a man who has gimme ghoul coins. 20 of them! Thank you, sir. We evolve our Fletch Ender into a Talonflame and finally decide to use the Chilling Water TM we got from Kofu on our Toxapex. This will definitely fill the baneful bunker-shaped hole in my heart. The gym challenge takes way longer than I think it had any right to. I literally don't use the minimap at all and the clues have me thinking way too deeply. The odd one out. Okay, there is a... With the... She has a hat. So are you the odd one out? Are you the place I can go inside? No. Bro, is this another Seabreeze Cafe? Were there two of them? Hold on, I'm sorry. That was Seabreeze Cafe? You got, you're lying to me, right? This is not also Sea... Why the f***? Oh my god. This game is so bad. Why would you make two? Why is there a need to be two? It's just stuff for the sake of stuff. At least name the restaurant something different. Check my map. Oh, the map. Upon finally solving the gym puzzle and locating the correct restaurant, we learn the secret ingredient from Larry and I oh. think murder uh -oh. some people? Oh my, wait, did all those people die? <laughs> Where did they go? <laughs> Bro, there was like at least 10 people eating there. If I hated Kofu, I love Larry. It's no secret, Larry is the best gym leader in the region, and I love his whole nine to five overworked businessman vibe. We have a pretty easy time with Larry though, as Hariyama cleans up both Komala and Dadun Sparse. Everybody's like, oh, this guy's gonna mop you. Like, guys, I've I've played so many ROM hacks. I had to introduce 33 rules to keep this challenging for me, so please. Yeah, simply by having a ghost type. 
Larry Staraptor proves to be no issue. Immediately after the gym fight, Nimona once again tracks us down and stealing him from you. Yo, what is going on here? I just got done eating, okay? The battlefield's calling? No, please, come on. Come on. You'd like to observe? She wants to watch. Nimona was pretty easy. Even despite her Meowskarada having an adaptability auto crit move, our Talon Flame is able to resist the hit and then KO with a combination of acrobatics and chip from a flame body burning. Some more suspect dialogue later, and we're finally able to do our post-boss tradition of executing one of our team members. I nominate Scovillain, Morgrim, and Talon Flame, and finally my chat decides to kill Scovillain. Thank you. RIP. Really bad. Can the rule be anytime an opponent uses a grass type move, I have to switch out to a different mon? E yes. Rule 37, the grass move rule. Every time my opponent uses a grass type move, I am now forced to switch out my current Pokemon for a waiting one. This, however, does not come into play if I switch in on a grass type move. The penalty for the infraction is being forced to discard 10 healing items of my choosing. Wait, what did I just use? Did I just use Magical Leaf? F I didn't switch out. God damn it! I toss. God, it's like. <laughs> How do I toss? I can't toss any items. How do I get rid of items? Okay, I guess I, selling them works because we can't really utilize our money effectively anyway. So it's not like helping us. After battling a number of trainers, I finally run into a trainer with a Mudsdale. I'm nervous of a ground type move, so I feel obligated to stay in with my Talon Flame to deal with it. I hope it doesn't have a Rock type move, but instead. This happened. Don't you dare have rock slide, though. Don't you rock slide me. No! <laughs> Everybody loves the counter shenanigans and those locks. Everybody loves it. After going through a cave that's totally not a separate area, we run into another trainer with a Paldean Tauros. I send in my Toxapex to eat whatever it has to throw at us, and it hits us with a Zen headbutt. I chilling water, and then to burn a turn, I click recover as its scary faces us. Now, this might be the most pivotal moment in the entire run. Oh no, no! Oh, yes! Let's go, Tauros! That's right. Because Tauros flinches us with headbutt, we don't end up using recover twice in a row saving it from being permanently deleted from our Toxapex's moveset. Let's go! This was the most generous crit flinch of all time. It's so easy to mash, eh? Our encounter in the Dali Zappa Passage is a Meowth, which, as you can tell, I'm not too happy with. Do you know how many good Pokemon are on this mountain? A normal type cat! I could have had a Honchkrow. I could have had a freaking... I could have had this thing... Positive attack minus spadef though. Wait a minute. My man's is naughty nature. Okay. With technician. Okay. Never mind. I take it back. <laughs> That's not that bad. And it's fast. It's not that bad. And wait, it's immune to ghost types. And I think the next gym is a ghost type gym. There's positives here. Never mind. I, I take it all back. Morgrim finally evolves into Grimmsnarl, which is not purple, guys. It, it, look. Look at this Pokemon. This is definitely not purple. If I were to take a dropper to this Pokemon, you think this would come back purple. Y'all really think this thing's purple, huh? You wonder why I never trust my chat. A couple battles later, our newly acquired Meowth evolves into Persian, and we enter the early part of Glaciato Mountain for another encounter. Which, upon watching back, there was a Citadel chasing me, who I just narrowly avoided somehow, as well as a Vigoroth who took three tries to tackle me. Do I want the Axew? Do I want the Mudbray? Yes. Will I take this thing? Also, yes. I'm just trying to find my way to the ghost type gym, but the mountain is so large and has so many trainers. I end up getting lost for a little bit, and we end up earning a few more levels before finally making it to Montenerva. But not before breaking rule 37 one more time on this Pulte, guys. Wait, use Giga Drain. Oh my god. Okay, we have to sell another 10 items. At some point, we pony up and finally decide to teach Hariyama Drain Punch from a TM, using the one available for this badge split. After we wrap with DJ Moist Critical for a bit, thank goodness this NPC actually looks like Charlie, otherwise this would just be another cringe event in a sea of cringe events, we get to Rhyme, the ghost type gym leader who challenges us to a double battle. This is definitely a unique and really odd battle, as both of our teams end up getting their stats buffed randomly by the crowd's cheers. 
I don't really get it, but it doesn't make the battle any harder, and we get past her with little issue. But as usual, this calls for another rule and another set of Pokemon to be put up on the chopping block. I know you want to kill Kelp. I will not allow you to kill Kelp. I can't trust you, chat. Y'all killed Jumpluff? I can't trust you. I spent hours at this point working for all the Gimme Ghoul coins, and I refused to let that hard work go to waste. I put up Persian, duh, Hariyama, and Grimmsnarl. Thankfully, my chat decides that Persian is indeed the LVP, and democratically, it's sent to the slaughterhouse. If I battle any trainer, I need to go in with Pokemon that is the opposite sex of the assumed sex of that trainer. Rule 38. This makes it so that we're forced to go into battles leading a Pokemon with the opposite gender as the assumed gender of the opposing trainer. And if I break the rule, three ethers must be sold. Specifically having to get rid of ethers is a huge problem, as while they're renewable, with rules 6 and 34 in the mix, we're constantly having to use them to refuel our power points. We continue our Gimme Ghoul hunt and make our way to South Province Area 6 where we're eligible to get another new encounter. This ends up being the obligatory Magikarp encounter. And of course, like any experienced Pokemon Challenge player, I'm totally okay with this. Hey, buddy. That was the most generous Gimme Ghoul of all time! My man gave me 50 coins! Against my better judgment, I decide to take a break from Gimme Ghoul coin hunting and fight the ground-type Great Tusk Titan in the Asado Desert, as we're much closer to its level now than literally every other time my chat asked me to fight it. We definitely have a not so great matchup versus Great Tusk, but we press onward anyway. The first phase was actually a little more difficult than the second phase, as I opted to lead Hariyama. The second phase, we led with Grimmsnarl, who with two damaging fairy moves, and in conjunction with Arvin's Scovillain, were able to take down our fourth Titan no problem. One doggo feeding cutscene later, and Koridon has unlocked the ability to glide. I nominate Vigoroth, Hariyama, and Grimmsnarl for the chopping block, and to my surprise, my chat decides to get a little frisky with their power and kills my Hariyama. There goes our assault vest. Hariyama had been with us since almost the very beginning, and despite having a brief stint locked away behind Rule 31, the yellow rule, has been a really important member of my team overall. My chat decides to lay it on even harder, kicking me while I'm down by amending Rule 28. Make the three Pokemon after a boss for chat to vote on randomly chosen. Making it so that instead of selecting the three Pokemon to be killed after a boss, they're chosen at random by RNG instead. I can't say no. This has horrifying implications and gives my chat the ability to vote out Pokemon that may be pivotal to the success of the run. We end the stream with the 747 Gimme Ghoul coins and evolve our Vigoroth into a slacking. Next stream, we open up with some good old fashioned Gimme Ghoul coin hunting and while looking for Gimme Ghoul by our house, we run into a Squawkabilly on top of our roof. Oh wait, you count as a Pokemon? Technically, Fuecoco's a gift Pokemon and I count them separately from area Pokemon, meaning that this Squawkabilly is fair game for us to catch. If you have an issue with this, it's level two. Please. During the hunt, our Magikarp evolves into Gyarados, and in Castle Royal Lake, we encounter a Tropius. We haven't had a grass type since Jumpluff, but I would have really rather preferred maybe Scyther with an Eviolite. We make our way to Alfernada through the Alfernada Cavern and run into a Gibble. Oh my god, I'm so excited, except, oh wait. Rule 17 disallows us to use pseudo-legendaries. But unlike the purple rule, we can re-roll for another encounter. Speaking of the purple rule, we run into a Sableye. Very clearly a purple Pokemon, and are forced to forfeit our encounter for the cave. We arrive in Alfernada, not feeling worried at all about the Psychic-type gym leader Tulip. We sort of brush past the city and venture up the mountain, hunting more Gimme Ghoul when we run into Eric the Worker. Eric here means business. Locked to leading Toxapex because of Rule 38, his lead Raichu proves to be a major problem. Forced to swap out, I go into Skeleturge as Eric sets up Electric Terrain. We're forced to take two Thunderbolts before we knock out Raichu and he switches in Electros. We swap out of Skeledurge into Grimmsnarl as Electros goes for what might have been a rain-boosted liquidation. Of course, it gets the defense drop and we have to go into slacking. We continue to eat strong electric hits and swap back into Grimmsnarl to finish off the eel with Sucker Punch. Uh -huh. Rounding out Eric's trio of electric types is Luxray. I opt to go into Toxapex since everything else is either weak to electric, low on health, or the gimme ghoul, and we eat a thunder. Do it again. Then another. Do it again. Then another. 
I think I outspeed and flamethrower or win the battle as long as it doesn't crit or para. <sighs> okay, this just got harder. That didn't do shit. I should have torch song. Oh, I should I threw I should have torch song. And then it hits a four thunder in a row, paralyzing my Skeleturge. Forced to risk a Pokemon, I go into Slacking, who eats the fifth thunder and dies. I'm not very happy about this, but there is some good news. This battle scared me straight, and I decided that we weren't going to progress until I assembled enough Gimme Ghoul coins. I spent the next hour running around the region, collecting stray Gimme Ghoul coins, and trying to locate chests that I didn't find previously. This could be all the ghoul. It gave me 60! <laughs> Let's go! We got ourselves a ghoul! A whole lot of ghoul! Now we gotta level up. Knowing that our Goldango is within reach, I decide to grind a bit in Casseroya Lake in order to get it an easy level so it can evolve. However, while I was certainly ready for the wild Pokemon, who I wasn't ready for was Vicente the Student. How high level is this gonna be? Gengar. Uh, yup, that's about what I thought. You're f***ing joking. No, 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 no. Yeah, perhaps grinding in the Casseroya Lake right now wasn't the best idea. Toxapex is able to set up some T-Spikes and hold off his overleveled Gengar for a few turns, but the main issue is that he clicks Destiny Bond on the turn that I decide to switch in my Grimmsnarl, meaning that I can't Sucker Punch without getting KO'd myself. We then, to play it as safe as possible, double into our Squawk ability on a Shadow Ball, scouting for a potential Sludge Wave. You're immune, baby! You're immune to the Shadow Ball! Haha! -ha! Good try, you dumb level 56! Oh, he has D-Pulse. Well, rip. This gives Grimmsnarl the ability to come in and Sucker Punch without fear of dying to Destiny Bond. Barrascuta comes out, and luckily we have a Toxapex, so there's no issue with stalling it out, but then Vicente sends in Braviary, who is not affected by Toxic Spikes and able to deal huge damage to my entire team. There are a few types we've historically struggled with over the course of the run, mostly due to our lack of diverse encounters. These types are Ground, Flying, Ghost, and Electric. Pretty much everything else we handle with no issue. Thankfully, instead of Brave Birding us over and over, the Braviary decides to repeatedly click Crush Claw. Except, of course, when I eventually send in Skeledurge, when it switches to Shadow Claw, giving me a heart attack in the process. After Vicente, Gyarados gets Hurricane, and finally, the moment we've been waiting for. Our Gimme Ghoul eats. Uh, absorbs? incorporates. Maybe possesses? What actually happens here? I I'm not really sure. Yeah, Goldengo is here. <laughs> this Pokemon gets along well with others and is quick to make friends with anybody. Wow. And it still only has Tackle and Astonish. With our Squawkabilly dead, we add Tropius to our party, and once again, we're down to only six Pokemon to our name. Despite only existing for two minutes or less, I give Goldengo our only set of leftovers. Convinced, as I put it here, he is that dude. I go to look up Goldengo's moveset, and I'm hit with the realization that it gets Shadow Ball at 35. It gets Recover at 42. Yeah, we just barely missed out on Recover, but due to Rule 18 and being unable to relearn moves, we're permanently locked out of a really good healing move. Whoa! Oh my god, it's a surfboard made of gold. He turns the bottom of his legs into the board. I'm such a fan. We're once again tracked down by Nimona and challenged to a battle. She's still not that difficult, as with all of our exploring and mini grinding session in Casseroya Lake, our highest level Pokemon are overleveled. Tulip's gym test makes no sense. The emotional spectrum practice confuses the hell out of me at first. Now, for whatever reason, I assumed that this was a rhythm game. I failed? What? Oh, before the circle fills? I thought I had to do it as the circle filled. You know, like a rhythm game? Excuse me for thinking it was a rhythm game. My apologies. Do I just have to do it once? Okay. You guys are acting like this is my fault the game's designed bad. I see okay, I think good, and I think great. 
and excellent, okay? Because I'm a rhythm gamer. I've played just dance. I'm thinking that there's more depth or timing or strategy or anything. You know, they're like, oh, he can't read. <laughs> he doesn't know how to play the, the mini game made for toddlers. Because I try to make more of stuff that's simple. Hence why my rule set has 39 rules <laughs> with subsections and clauses. Some easy trainer battles and a couple more rounds of basically bop it. Uh, we head into the gym and does she have two Metacham bodyguards? The Metachams are tier three subs. <laughs> our Skeledurge basically cleans up her team until Florgus hits the field, where we send in our newly evolved Goldengo to wallet and finish it up with some Astonishes and Shadow Balls. Now, this is the first time the Executioner's block is entirely out of my hands. We roll a three, a two, and a five, meaning the lives of my Toxapex, Goldengo, and Gyarados are on the line. Voting commences, and my chat, seemingly in their right mind as compared to the last vote, decide Gyarados is the weakest link, and banish it to the death box for eternity. We then load Goldengo with another TM immediately, teaching it Thunderbolt as my chat declares that Rule 36, the experience rule, is not ridiculous enough. Maybe I can also give them candies if I do exercises IRL. 10 push-ups for a candy? 1 for extra small, 5 for small, 10 for medium, 15 for a large. After a battle to use the candy out of Pokemon, that battled. And it only works for trainer battles. Deal. That's perfect. Before ending stream, I make sure to kill this random gentleman's Squovit with Goldengo and decide to put my nose to the grindstone. Or really, the floor, I guess. We'll call it a 25 because I'm out of shape. It was 23? So now it's 30. God dang it. I'm really out of shape. This nets Goldengo three large experience candies, as I'm trying to catch it up with the rest of my team as fast as possible. Opening up the next stream, another set of 15 gives me an additional large candy. This rule's actually like a grind. It's literally gains for gains. I and mean, I'm drinking coffee too. Maybe I won't do too much of that at the beginning of this stream, because that just ruined my body, I think. Moving forward to the next and final gym, we complete the snow slope run and challenge Grusha, but not before accepting Tropius as a member of my team, giving it a calm mint and a shell bell. Tropius isn't going to do anything in this battle, but I figured I'd mention some of the small details we take into account before every boss fight. Grusha, as expected, is not a problem for my team. And thankfully, with only five Pokemon to our name, we aren't forced to sacrifice one for the cause. This, however, does not stop the rule creation portion of the tradition, and Rule 39, the super effective rule, is created. Ending use of super effective moves. Oh, wow. This rule prevents us from using super effective moves versus enemy Pokemon. And if a super effective move lands, we're forced to then delete the move that caused the hit, similar to the Torment rule. Of course, this rule was finalized during a battle with an Umbreon, who just refused to die. Rule 39, combined with Rule 32, Rule 34, and Rule 37, make it so that even random trainer battles now have the potential to last forever. In North Province Area 3, we catch a Flamingo! We meet up with Clive again, do some more push-ups, and start killing some high-leveled Golducks with our Goldengo before the Fairy-type Team Star leader, Ortega. Meanwhile, I'm EV training, you guys don't even realize it. Being unable to use super effective moves is definitely a problem for this fight, but my three best Pokemon all resist Fairy, so I'm relatively safe here. Now, Ortega leads Azumarill, and in the interest of not wanting my Pokemon to be paralyzed by Bounce, I stay in with Toxapex and slowly but surely use Chilling Water and Rocky Helmet to whittle down Azumarill as we set up some T-Spikes. He's stalling. No, you guys made these rules. All this rule does is makes battles a half an hour. Well, kinda. The super effective rule definitely artificially extends the game, but what are you gonna do? I think it's a, it's a, it's a fine decision. I'd stick with my guns. I'm not going back on it. If you guys want it gone, then get rid of it. With the Zoomer out of the way, Skeledurge is able to alternate Torch Songs and Shadow Balls and really easily take out Ortega, ironically proving to be the least troublesome of the Team Star bosses thus far. One more hyper cringe Team Star cutscene later, Penny shows up, and she's definitely not the leader of Team Star. <laughs> no way, no how. Definitely not. On the chopping block, Skeledurge, Goldengo, and Tropius. 
Yeah, if my chat were a bit crueler to me, I'm sure they would have taken the opportunity to kill one of the staple members of my team. But thankfully, they chose the high road and decided Tropius had to go. I put in a mint to this thing. I gave it the Giga Drain TM. I actually made it kind of a decently valuable Pokemon. But, alas, it has been voted on. On the bright side, they also decide to amend Rule 18 to make it so that I'm able to use one TM per Pokemon per split, making adjusting our movesets a little easier before going into the final stretch of the game. And I mean stretch of the game. North Province Area 3 is insanely laggy and unoptimized, and combined with the parade of Floettes always surrounding me and their grass-type moves, maneuvering through here takes a long time. The game literally can't handle this area. It's actually embarrassing. I played Xenoblade 3. Come on, we can do better than this, Nintendo. North Province Area 1, I'm not entirely sure if we've gotten an encounter here, but I'm going to double check. I don't think we've gotten a North Province encounter besides this Flamingo. Is this the North Paldean Sea? Wait, now it's Casaroya Lake. Now I'm very confused. There was no title there. I'm pretty sure this green line is supposed to designate the North Paldean Sea, so I decide now's as good a time as any to get my encounter here, where we run into our first electric type of the attempt. Oh? <gasps> that was a crit and a para? Oh, he's already a beast. We get back on the grind, killing some chances in North Province Area 3, and sacrifice my arms more to use some more candies to level up our newly acquired Tynamo into Electric. Cutting through the Sakurit Trail, we encounter Toad School. Yes, I love this thing. Before continuing on to continue grinding Electric. Before evolving to Electros, I want to ensure it gets Acid Spray at level 49. Also, opting to teach it Volt Switch via TM. I fly over to North Province Area 1 and drop in to get my encounter, Hawlucha. I'm very confident. Oh, I can't click Shadow Ball. Never mind. What the hell? This is so dumb. The super effective rule sucks. I'm not going to lie to you guys. The super effective rule is extending the challenge. Turns out that combining the inability to use super effective moves with not being able to select the same move in a row just leads to a lot of switching. And a lot of low damage output. Who would have thought? In North Province Area 2, we end up encountering a Shinx and immediately have to fight its dad for custody. It's at the point my chat informs me that I'm actually able to catch Pokemon at the Team Star bases if they're lured into the vicinity. Earlier, when I caught the Swablu, despite standing in the base's area, because I threw my ball at a Pokemon outside the base, it didn't register as its caught location, tricking me into believing that this wouldn't be a thing. This gives us exactly five more encounters in the run, which may have come in handy to know a little bit earlier, but what the heck, we made it this far, right? Is this Navi's squad? I'm just gonna shut my eyes, all right? What? No way, what? Navi's squad's base. That's a valid encounter. Let's try to do this at the other places then, shall we? At the Sheeter squad's base, we catch a Deerling. At the Sagan squad's base, we chase down a Mudbray who was the only Pokemon in sight. At the Ruckboss squad's base, we encounter a Sunflora. Before we take on the fifth and final Team Star base, we decide to take on the Water Titan in Castle Royal Lake. Now, obviously, not having played Pokemon Scarlet and Violet before, the first thing I do is Thunderbolt Dondozo, thinking it was a Water Dragon type. Oh, that's super effective. Oh, I'm an idiot. I have to delete T-Bolt after the battle. Yeah, there goes T-Bolt on Electros. An unfortunate consequence of the newly introduced Rule 39. Looking around for the second phase of the Titan fight, there's really nothing more terrifying than having random Dondozos just emerge from the lake. They're just huge and imposing. This second phase has Dondozo eat Tatsugiri and the Herba Mystica. And this time, I just wallet with Toxapex, as I should have done in the first place. Can I get a poison? What's a man gotta do to get a poison around here? Let's go, Toxapex. We easily take down Dondozo and Tatsugiri once Tatsugiri escapes from Dondozo. I'm not sure if I understand the relationship between these two Pokemon, but we complete the final Titan of the game. With Arvin's Mabastiff fully recovered and Coridon with the very helpful ability to climb. Boss down, new rule, and with six Pokemon in the party, another three random Pokemon get placed on the chopping block. As you could probably tell by the snippet of messages, my chat really wasn't a fan of the newly implemented Rule 39, and therefore they decided the super effective rule must be terminated. I mean, I'm not going to argue with that. 
I think the intention of the rule was to make the game tougher on me, but all it really did was drag out the battles to such an extensive degree and remove a big piece of what makes Pokemon entertaining to watch. Electros, Flamigo, and Goldengo are randomly put up for nomination, and yeah, in one of the least close votes we've ever had, Flamigo is put to rest. We add our newly caught Spite Ops to the party, because I like it. <laughs> Spite Ops! Spite Ops is coming with us. At Team Star's base, we get another encounter being this Scyther. I'm pretty happy with it, as even though we can't trade our Pokemon to evolve it into Scizor this run, Scyther itself is a pretty solid bug and flying type. After the obligatory auto battle section, we come face to face with Team Star boss Aerie, and definitely the most challenging Team Star boss in the entire game. Not knowing her team prior to the fight, I lead Skeledurge, and wanting to save my HP, I switch immediately to Toxapex to set up Toxic Spikes on her Toxicroak, knowing there's no other poison fighting type in the entire game. For whatever reason, six and a half hours deep into the stream, I go for Toxic Spikes twice in a row. Oh no, no, I have to kill T-Spikes! Yeah, it's that easy to forget the Torment rule. It goes against everything that's natural in Pokemon, and certainly we've paid the price throughout the run. Toxapex takes down the Toxicroak with no issue as we switch back into Skeledurge, hoping to get a leg up on Lucario. This leads to Skeledurge eating a Dragon Pulse and then a Dark Pulse that makes us flinch, putting us at half HP. Wanting to save more HP, I send back in Toxapex to eat this Dark Pulse, and then in a Grimmsnarl to be immune to the next Dragon Pulse. Passimian gets walled by Goldengo, and I go into Spite Ops to insult Aerie and to maybe gain a little bit of experience. Goldengo comes back out, kills Passimian, and Annihilate comes out, and here's where the problems start. Annihilate's Fire Punch burns Toxapex, doing some passive damage and putting us in dire need of a recover. Do I think... It kills me with Rage Fist at minus one attack. No. I think I click Recover here. We're going to have to find out. Not even close. I was so scared of this move. And there's the car. Wait, do I not get to Recover? There's no way. There's no way I don't get to Recover because of that. What? What? Because of the cutscene? I cannot stress enough how much Team Star cheats. I click recover, Aerie screams in a cutscene, and Annihilate faints to Rocky Helmet damage, completely skipping over Toxapex's turn because of the weird boss battle quirks. It literally stole a turn from me. Now, here's the big issue. Revivroom is able to kill both Skeledurge and Toxapex with a Stomping Tantrum, especially after I switch in Electros, expecting the Stomping Tantrum, and it just decides to shift gear. Let's recap here. The Team Star Mobiles are not affected by status moves like Soak, don't take passive damage from moves like Salt Cure or Fire Spin, aren't affected by hazards like Toxic Spikes, and have unbelievably powerful stab moves with added effects and have abilities that make taking them down even harder. I can't believe we didn't get the recover off. Might need a sack of to win this. Yeah, that's sort of what I'm thinking. How do I get out of here? Because we are in danger of wiping. We're in danger of wiping because of that recover. We send in Spite Ops to get a free switch, which I don't feel too good about. RIP Jumpman. You did absolutely great. I'm sorry we didn't get to use more of you. And go into Grimmsnarl to bait the spin out. This gives us an in into Goldengo. Baiting a high horsepower, we go into Electros to be immune, baiting another combat torque. Utilizing Electros and Goldengo, we can bait moves to get Goldengo up to full health, letting it live a high horsepower from a plus one attack Revivroom. Goldengo does an insane amount of damage with Make It Rain. Oh my god, Kelp! Mostly due to the minus two Spadef from Acid Spray. Now, my logic is to keep abusing the AI to get more HP back on Goldengo to be able to safely finish it off but on my first switch into Electros, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, this thing is now at plus two attack, plus two defense, and plus two speed, ready to kill another one of my Pokemon, all because it skipped Toxapex recovering. We switch into Grimmsnarl, expecting it to be able to kill. We calc how much a Sucker Punch can do at this point. Again, in hindsight, we were calcing with Revivroom stats, not with the actual Team Star Mobile stats. There goes our Grimmsnarl. I'm not happy with how that battle went, but I am happy the run's alive and well. If it didn't go for spin out, we wiped, right? Yeah. Yes. 
actually. Yeah, actually, yes. We roll Sunflora, Hawlucha, and Skeletor, which is our Pokemon, on the chopping block. Kill the flower so I can add Toad Squirrel. I implore you. Sunflora was pretty easily dispatched by my chat, as my outpouring of love for Toad School and Toad Squirrel was enough to convince them not to harm my starter. Dissolve the no status rule, then. Rule 35 is then dissolved. All right. I think this was made since they wanted me to be able to use Spore on Toad Scroll, but unfortunately, we already missed that move by level up, so getting rid of the jump luff nerfing rule really doesn't come back into play here. With our remaining money, we end up back in Mesa Goza and purchase an expert belt for Electros, also giving a miracle seed to Toad Scroll. Halucha also receives the Focus Sash. All 18 badges in Paldea have been collected, so from this point forward, our rule set is locked for the final gauntlet of the game. We take the next half an hour or so in order to try and catch Hawlucha and Toad Screw up with the rest of my party. We kill Golduck in North Province Area 3 for a bit, and with Toad Screw finally at 57 and Hawlucha at 50, I feel confident to take on the final portion of Operation Starfall. Allow me to reveal my true identity. And he grew more clothes from underneath his clothes, and he challenges us to a battle. Clavel has a team of Pokemon at level 60 and above, making most of our team underleveled. Now, for whatever reason, Clavel's actually a real trainer, and not only has great coverage, but a number of ways to set up and support the rest of his team. You'd think there'd be a crowd of students, but they're just, they're walking through the battle, you know, at five frames a second, you know, not, not a big deal at all. Pulte Geist. Uh... You're not going to shell smash in my face, are you? This battle was something we weren't really prepared for, if I'm being completely honest, as after we get rid of his Oranguru and Abomasnow, his Poltegeist proves to be a huge issue for our team. We eat this, right? We eat this. We're calm nature. We're calm nature. Was it a crit? No, it wasn't. There goes a Pokemon I was absolutely stoked to use. What I should have done here is send in Toxapex to eat a Shadow Ball, but instead I go into Hawlucha to abuse my Focus Sash. Unfortunately, it decides to go for Will-O-Wisp as I fly, breaking my sash and letting it live on 1 HP as I'm forced to cut my losses and sack this thing as well. Y'all had me confident saying this was easy when he has a shell smash Pulte in the back. This was a blatant misplay on my end, and Clavel is shaping up to be the toughest trainer yet. Toxapex pulls past Houndoom, Scaladurge and Goldengo handle Amoongus, and Toxapex is finally able to barely wall out the terrestrialized Quaquaval. To end out the battle, we end up almost using Poison Jab twice in a row. Oh! I have to, I literally have to get rid of Poison Jab now. It might be worth it. literally might have been worth it. Oh, it died. I didn't use it! I didn't use it! I didn't use the second one! I didn't use the second one! We deposit Toad Scroll and Hawlucha and add both Scyther and Mudbray to the team. We give Scyther the Eviolite and also give it the Trailblaze TM and travel back to the Sakurit Trail to kill some Fortresses and Heracross to level up our new team members. After about an hour, we return once again to the Academy to fight Cassiopeia. Hello, Cassiopeia. Oh my god. With the hood? This is the... This is the worst thing I've ever seen. This is our evil team leader. As if Penny wasn't cringe enough as is, her team consists entirely of evolutions. If you guys have been around long enough, you know how I feel about this. No Glaceon though, that's a positive. Also, her theme's pretty great. I'd be lying if I said that these battle themes weren't absolute bangers all around. I'm clicking T-Spikes. This is why you don't run a team of evolutions on the ladder, okay? I know you think you're cool running OU with six evolutions. They're all hazard weak. They don't complement each other. They're all single type. Most of their abilities are terrible. Your VV power will crush me into Stardust. <laughs> Sorry, I, I gagged. Sorry, I, I had to, I, I just gagged. Penny is super duper easy, as Toxapex walls Flareon and allows us to get up two layers of T-Spikes to basically cripple her for the rest of the battle. Clive shows up and gives Penny the shock of her life. Turns out, Clive and Director Clavel are the same person. The old geezer act? She didn't know? Oh, oh man. Oh man. Oh, it is hard to it is hard to follow this. Tech Geek Mastermind Penny. I couldn't tell. We sit through the last cringy Team Star cutscene of the game, and Clavel, being the absolute beast he is, finally stands up against these cheaters. 
That's right, lay down the law, Clavel. Tell them that they cheat. Tell them their cars were responsible for the death of my Grimmsnarl. Let them know, Clavel. Tell them that that's not how Pokemon battles work. Tell them that you have an HP bar and you're affected by hazards and status and all of these different things that soak should work on a Pokemon. Tell them that they're big, lousy cheaters. Lay down the law, Clavel. You send them back to the classroom. Teach them how to play fair. With Starfall Street complete, we choose to take on Path of Legends' final boss next, being Arvin at the Poco Lighthouse. The official art for Arvin tells us he's not good at Pokemon battling, but I constantly hear that he's one of the only trainers to actually beat players on their first attempt. The battle plays out almost exactly the same way as Clavel, getting past his first two Pokemon with no problems, but once he sends in Garganicle, we realize we don't have the best team to handle it. Mudsdale would be a good option, but it's nine levels lower, and- Stamina? Wait, I'm sorry. You have own tempo? Oh my god. We take it out with Toxapex and kill Cloyster with our Electros. Arvin's Mabastiff kind of destroys my team, as its terastalized crunches do an insane amount of damage to everything. He chunks Scyther and then does another huge chunk to Toxapex, putting me within range of dying to Psychic Fangs. We're kind of put back into a spot where we need to send in Mudsdale to give us a free switch, and banking on a quick claw pop, we click Superpower. This doesn't really play out for us, and Mudsdale ends up falling to another crunch. Scyther comes in to finish off the newly healed Doggo, and Path of Legends is complete. Beginning to make our way toward the Pokemon League, we realize we never actually got another encounter here, as a place we'd never been before. We catch ourselves Fido, who's immediately added to the team, as I forgot to place another Pokemon there after Mudsdale died, and we're unable to switch out party members once they enter, according to rule number 7. Now, I try my darndest to complete the game during this stream, but needing to level up Doxbun some more, we end the stream by returning to North Province Area 3, taking advantage of a Chansey outbreak to get some easy, quick levels. Honestly guys, speaking of rule 7, Here's why I actually decide to slightly break it. Without being able to turn off the experience share, and for the interest of keeping the content interesting, I didn't want my team getting too overleveled. I boxed my higher level members, so we only had Doxbun and Electros fighting wild encounters. I don't think anybody cares that much. I'd rather just have my Pokemon not be level 73. Of course, before ending the stream, I accidentally mash A too much and click play rough twice in a row, causing our new Pokemon to lose the only damaging fairy type move it gets by level up. Oh no! No! I haven't taught it a TM yet. Is play rough even a TM? We need question mark, question mark, question mark. It's fantastic. Opening the next stream, we start grinding materials for the last set of TMs we'll be able to teach our Pokemon, including a replacement Play Rough TM for Doxbun and an Earth Power TM for Skeledurge. We gather the materials for Play Rough no problem and get all the materials for Earth Power except for Barboach Slime. I've never seen a wild Barboach, I don't think, so far. This is a marsh. This, this, this would, this'll work. It, there will be a Barboach here. This, this'll, this'll be a Barboach. It'll be fine. It could be in the stream, high key. Whoa, Psyducks. Very quickly, I'm gonna put Buns out of the back of the party. Anytime I hear Mouse Outbreak, I immediately think I'm gonna get a shiny Pokemon, and I immediately get very, very scared. If I can get through this whole challenge without one shiny, that'd be ideal. We got one, it's all good. It's all good, we got one. We just need two more now. As we search high and low for two more Barboach, we're told that Barboach have a higher chance to spawn in the water of the Tag Tree Thicket and fast travel over there to hopefully wrap up this side quest before taking on the Elite Four. Barboach, where are you Barboach? Just, just a cup of Barboach. I'm tired of Basculin, I'm tired of Psyducks. It's ponds? You told me to check the water in the Tag Tree Thicket. The singular pond. All right, let's go to the singular pond. There it is! Shoddy Psyduck is here! It has arrived! No! No! Because of the barboach! Because we looked for a barboach for literally 20 minutes, this is the first shiny we've encountered in the run. Rule 22. If the player finds a shiny Pokemon at any point, the last Pokemon in their active party will die. Shiny Pokemon are cringe and a bad omen for the run. Before I started this Barboach hunt, you guys may not have even heard me say it. I said, 
I'm gonna switch Bunza to the back of the party because Kelp was in the back of the party. I said it, in case we find a shiny Pokemon. I literally said it. And we've never found a shiny Pokemon for however many hours of gameplay. But somehow I knew the game would do that to me. Somehow I just knew. Oh yeah, that's purple. That's purple, right? That's that's super purple, right? That lets us add Pikmin fan one, two, three to the party though, which is uh, which is something. Do I even keep looking for Barboach? <laughs> I mean, I want Earth Power still. Barboach have to be the most rare fucking Pokemon in the entire world. It took me 40 minutes to get three Barboach. <laughs> With our lucky egg permanently removed from play, thanks to both rules eight and 22, we decide that to train up our Deerling most effectively, we should utilize a single picnic granted to us by Rule 19 and a portion of our remaining money to buy ingredients, increasing the encounter rate of normal types. There we go. Plop. Beautiful. Delicious. I have 10 minutes to do this. You guys think I'll get it in time? One picnic later and about an hour of grinding up Deerling into Sawsbuck, we're ready to head into the Pokemon League. After a quick interview with Rika, we enter the League no turning back. Despite being the first and lowest level Elite Four member, Rika definitely has the best matchup into my team, specifically her camera up able to hit my Pokemon super effectively, except for Electros. We actually luck out pretty hard with camera up as before we fall asleep to yawn, it lands a Fire Blast that burns us, preventing us from falling asleep at all. In addition, her next Fire Blast misses, putting us in a prime position for Electros to start mopping up with Giga Drain and Acid Spray. Her Clod Sire proves to be a little more difficult, but with some tricky pivoting, we get around it and are able to take it out with Scyther. Next up is the literal toddler, whose Skeledurge easily solos. Larry also proves to be a little bit tricky, as his Ace Flamigo hits extremely hard with Brave Bird and Close Combat, but we're able to lower its attack and finish it off with Electros. Bro, everybody's all business here except for the toddler. Three of them have ties. <laughs> and then there's the toddler. Hassle was the one I think I was most scared for, as we had no ice or fairy type moves, but with some toxic spikes, smart pivoting, and a massive make it rain from Goldengo, we make it past the Elite Four with no problem. And now, for the most disappointing champion of all time, Gita is a big giant joke. And there's a lot I have to say about her team comp and the order in which she sends out her Pokemon, but you all know we don't have any trouble with her, right? This, this is just obvious, I think. Eventually, we set up a substitute on Gogo with our Goldengo and make it rain all over the place on her Glamora, becoming a champion by taking down the worst champion in the franchise thus far. But that's not all for this path. Nimona is actually the final boss of this section of the game, and she's substantially tougher than anything we encountered in the Elite Four. And like every trainer in Scarlet and Violet, her theme song slaps. I gotta hand it to the composers. Despite all the issues with Scarlet and Violet, the direction they took the music, especially when compared to Sword and Shield, has been really impressive. Nimona, being a real Pokemon trainer, sets up Rocks turn one. We're able to one-shot the Lycanroc and send in Electros on Orthworm. The rocks, the rocks make this kinda tough. To avoid its earthquake and one-shot it with Flamethrower. Dodon Sparse is definitely a massive issue for my team, and expecting it to coil, I Acid Spray to lower its Bidef, as I send in Goldango on the inevitable Hyper Drill. Make It Rain easily takes it out, and in comes Palmot, who chunks Goldango, but cannot stand up to a barrage of Shadow Balls and Make It Rain. Gudra is handled pretty well by Toxapex, and gives us the opportunity to set up a couple layers of Toxic Spikes to help handle the inevitable Meowskarada, who hilariously enough, gets walled by. Get him, Pikmin fan, one, two, three. Make it happen. Despite doing almost nothing in the Elite Four, this thing has access to Sap Zipper, preventing Meowskarada from being able to Flower Trick. The reason this is so important is because Rule 37, combined with Rock's damage, means that every time we're forced to switch out, we not only have potential to eat the move itself, but also damage on top of that. You're the best, Pikmin fan. Get him. Oh. Ah. Uh, oh. Oh. Pikmin fan moment. <laughs> Get ready to see my partner use its signature move, auto crit, terrestrialized. Here's my level 58 saws buck. Eat my ass, Nimona. She was like, actually, like, that was a hard battle. I, was, I mean, like, yeah, I have to use torment rules and whatever, but like, still. That's a great team. She has an insane team. 
With Victory Road, Operation Starfall, and the Path of Legends all completed, all that's left to do is the fourth story, The Way Home. Arvin, Nimona, Penny, and myself descend into the great crater of Paldea. Wait, oh, they're, she's, they're leaving without me? That's my dude! Yo, that is unsafe! I've seen Karaidon's mount capabilities. If I fell, I'm dying. It's not gonna be able to save me. I saw it crash at the beginning of the game, dude. No. In Area Zero, we catch ourselves a Metacham, who we will never be able to use, and follow the path deeper and deeper, disabling the locks to the Zero Lab as we go. Area Zero gives me some serious Xenoblade vibes with the music and the overworld running and dialogue, and is a pretty neat part of Scarlet and Violet as a whole. Definitely a great culmination of everything the game works toward overall, and probably my personal favorite part of the game. Do I wish it was a little more fleshed out throughout the game? Maybe. But for a final section of a Pokemon game, this hits all the right notes. Turns out, Professor Sada, Arvin's mom, is dead, and in her place is an AI robot with her knowledge and memories. Characters rarely die in Pokemon games, and this development sets a really unique tone for the remainder of the game. She shows off the time machine that's been bringing the ancient Pokemon forward in time, and lets us know we're going to have to defeat her in order to protect Paldea from the impending threat of these powerful Paradox Pokemon. Say that five times fast. This is one of the coolest plots ever put into a Pokemon game, and it gets even cooler as we activate the time machine, opening a hole to the past, and prepare to fight. The Master Ball just drops out of the sky? That was so cool! She she caught a Pokemon in a Master Ball, and now she's immediately gonna battle me with it! And she just... sends it off a cliff! The battle against AI Sada is a tough one. We lead with Scyther, and without a physical flying type move, we're unable to one-shot the Slitherwing she leads with. I opt to Air Slash, and then Swords Dance the following turn to be able to hit the next Pokemon that comes in hard. We miss an Air Slash, and Low Sweep lowers our speed. I Trailblaze to get back to neutral, and X Scissor in order to guarantee a kill. Fluttermane is where the issues really start. Ghost Fairy is an absurd type, and she has the ability to hit all of my Pokemon for super effective damage, except for Electros. What's my out versus Fluttermane? This thing's ubers! This isn't cool! I send an Electros, eat a couple Shadow Balls, and get off a slow Volt Switch into Sawsbuck, who we know can eat a single Mystical Fire. Now, I was under the assumption that Horn Leech would be able to kill it, but it eats it up, and now we're in a horrible spot. In order to get in a Pokemon to deal with Fluttermane, we're forced to sacrifice Sawsbuck to get in Toxapex, who's able to finish it off with a Poison Jab. Brute Bonnet comes in, and we're easily able to come in with Scyther and put ourselves in a great spot by setting up a Swords Dance as it clicks Sucker Punch and X Scissoring it. Okay! Please tell me it's Magneton. Yes! It's Magneton! Oh, that's so massive! I was incredibly nervous about Sandy Shocks, as without Sawsbuck and without a boost, it was able to do massive damage to everything on my team. I Calc Trailblaze to kill and increase my speed stat, letting me outspeed both Screamtail and Roaring Moon, winning the battle. As long as we can get around Ments, it'll be okay. Except this happens instead. Okay, no, we didn't crit. We died instead. Oh, wait! No way! What?! You're kidding! I could have trailblazed and I could have X-Scissored and we could have won! Easy. We just unfreeze. With Scyther gone, Roaring Moon becomes a huge problem with booster energy. Toxapex comes out, wanting to recover off some damage and get off Toxic Spikes in order to ensure we can put the Roaring Moon on a timer. I can only set up one layer. No, no, no. No, 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 I can only set up one layer. No! This flinch prevents us from setting up Toxic Spikes this turn, and what I would wanted to do was get up the Spikes, go to Goldango, and sub up to make sure we could get a lot of damage on Roaring Moon. We farm some leftovers recovery on Goldango, take out Screamtail, and it finally hits the field, breaking my substitute as Make It Rain chunks it for about half health. He's got EQ, that's the thing. I think we do, I think we lose, guys. I, I don't see I don't see an out condition here. The out condition was getting a layer of T spikes up because what I wanted to do is I wanted to stall T spikes with Rocky Helm Chip with the Make It Rain. I have 268 and 171. That's that playthrough stats, baby. Uh, okay, we live a non crit. Louis lives a non crit. Don't crit. Nice. Helmet damage. Okay, nope. Saw EQ. That's fine. This battle came down to the wire. 
And with some pivoting, we get some more chip damage on Roaring Moon with Rocky Helmet, putting us into a position where Skeledurge, as long as it doesn't get crit, hold on to your hats. Yes! One scripted battle versus Coridon later, my Terra Orb's glowing. Oh, it's scripted. What if I don't want to? I promise I won't terrestrialize. What? I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do it. It just did it. Ah, oh, dang. According to my rules, guys, no terrestrialization ever. Rule number 27. If the game forces the player to terrestrialize in a tutorial, we celebrate the Pokemon who terrestrializes. The Pokemon is then overcome with joy and dies. And that was it. Pokemon Scarlet, the most ridiculous challenge. This was an awesome time. And Pokemon Scarlet, despite being an incredible mess at points, definitely impressed me way more than Sword and Shield. Letting my chat get in the mix by killing my Pokemon and crafting new rules for me to adapt to made this the most unique Pokemon game I've ever played and really spiced up what would have otherwise been a pretty tame experience. Let me know your favorite part of the run, your favorite rule maybe. Subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Till next time.